All right, welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, uh, we check out some of the coolest head tube badges in mountain biking. We also have a look at the new bikes from Da Vinci, another new bike from Ibis, and some wicked comments from you amazing people. Okay, so straight into the topic first, and this is all talking about head tube badges. Now, a few weeks back I asked you about them, and in last week's show I asked you for any cool badges out there. So I've taken note of a few, and we've had a whip around the office, and a few other people have talked about stuff. So we've got a selection here of some of the coolest ones. But I just want to read out a really good comment from Gary Bill, who said, a sticker type head tube badge is an utter cop out. It has to be a bonded on proper badge. Maybe that's why the head tube badge on my Curtis looks insane. Or maybe it's just because the whole bike looks absolutely insane and the badge is a cherry on the top. Yeah, do you know what? Um, I kind of agree with that. I think a head tube badge is the real place on a bike where the brand could be like, we are here, have a look at this badass bike. So going along with that, let's go straight in with Intense. Now here's the Intense one on screen. It's about as cool as you get, really. They've always had, well, they've had the Fro logo as well. It's not quite as strong as this one. So this one, it says Cycle Works Intense Racing. It's got the checkered racing flags and flames. Jeff builds bikes. That's what it's all about. It's an awesome brand, a really cool head tube badge as well. I actually think head tube badges are a thing I could start a collection of. Could that be the new stamp collecting? Don't know. Well, anyway, next one, new proof. Uh, this came from you lot, actually. I kind of completely overlooked it, even though I've got two sat right there. Yeah, the radiation logo, I guess it doesn't need to be anything else. It's as simple as, and it's just clean and simple. Um, a favorite of mine, actually, that a few of you mentioned was Ibis. Now, Ibis Cycles, I'm not sure if anyone's aware, but they get the name from the bird. Now, Scott Nickel is a huge wildlife fan. He's the man behind uh, Ibis Bikes, also known as Chuck. Now, he was looking through all the bike brands that already use some of the, like, the birds that he loves. And he's like, damn it, like, I really want the name of a bird because I love what it implies. Something very light and efficient that can fly. You know, I guess a bike has a lot to do with that. And Scott, of course, rides all sorts of different bikes. So he could, he could appreciate the lightweightness from uh, road cycles as well as mountain bikes. So I've got written down here, some of the, the names that he really appreciated was Avocet, really nice name, Falcon, Condor, Swift. Kestrel, um, and in Merlin, of course, which I actually don't, had to double check on Merlin because um, I wasn't quite sure about that, but it is a type of bird of prey. So, um, but he liked the Ibis because it was long-legged, looked slender, and well, that's basically why they picked that logo. I think it's really cool. Um, here's an interesting one, Stiff. Now, this is a UK brand, so some of you overseas might not know about Stiff, but it used to be a windsurfing shop called Stiff Sailboards. That's where it gets the name from because they wanted to be Stiff Sailboards. Now, a lot of the UK industry actually stems from windsurfing. Now, when it wasn't windy, they would sit around with not much to do because a lot of the windsurfing locations in the UK was old quarries that they flooded and turned into inland lakes. And of course, some real lakes as well. But the point is, when a lot of the windsurfers were coming back from competitions in the States, they were bringing back mountain bikes with them, which were a brand new thing. So it kind of kick-started the industry and a lot of the early bike shops in the UK used to be windsurfing related. So there was Stiff, which was Stiff Sailboards. There was Leisure Lakes, speaks for itself. There's enough of them out there, but it's really cool. And anyhow, so it's a great bike shop, always has been, and make their own bikes under the name Morph. Um, now, I'm not quite sure on the name of the Morph bikes, but I have a feeling it's something to do with Paul Morfitt, who was the owner or the original person that started Stiff. So kind of cool, all of that, I think. And if you haven't seen the Morph bike, it's amazing, it's a really cool hardtail. They've also got a Squatch with the 29 inch version to pretty much the same thing, as far as I know. Um, next up, Orange. Yeah, another early British brand. So, I mean, look at the logo. It's as cool and clean as you get. In fact, I think it's probably the cleanest logo of all of these, and uh, I love it. It's so iconic, as far as the logos go. Now, the name Orange is actually an interesting one. You might not know about this. So, it kind of comes from, the original brand's name that they started was called All Range because they wanted to show their bikes could cover an all range of riding, basically. Uh, but they started saying all range fast, and all range, orange, 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 orange. Orange sounds good, so they went with orange, and their first bike they called the Orange Clockwork, after their favorite film by Stanley Kubrick. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, what else? The Kona Honzo ESD. Now, I didn't, I'd didn't. i seen the bike, but I didn't realize it had such a cool head tube badge. This is it. It's, well, it looks like a ram with a lightning bolt on his forehead. That's pretty mean, isn't it? And apparently, the Honzo ESD comes with a custom head tube badge that holds special powers and wards off mosquitoes and flat terrain. 
but that's a unique selling point if I've ever heard one. That makes me want to buy one right now. I <laughs> know that's great. Okay, next up, Salsa. Yeah, another great simple logo, and it's nothing to do with bikes, which is kind of cool, like the orange one, uh, even though it is a bike brand. Now, rumour has it that Ross Schaefer, like Mr. Salsa, he used to love his chips and salsa so much that ended up calling his bike brand Salsa. I, I love that. I think that's great. And it's a cool logo. No, chili pepper. It's really good. Um, Rocky Mountain. Okay, so going back to uh, Gary's comment, yeah, I do agree with you because Rocky Mountain, they could do better. However, it's probably my favourite logo of all bike companies uh, because it does what it says on the tin, the Rocky Mountains. It just looks cool. They've also got the coolest or probably the best uh, website name out there. They've got bikes.com, which they set, set up right at the beginning of the internet, which I just think is hilarious that they've got that website. It must be worth a lot of money now. Um, but I'm pretty sure that they used to have like a CNC machined or, you know, like a, a metal logo badge out there. If anyone can remember, or if anyone has one, uh, let's let's have a look at it. I'm not, you know, I might be wrong. I always remember seeing the red and white logo, but I'm pretty sure they've done some alternative ones over the years. But um, I've been wrong about stuff before. Okay, Linsky. Now this is a really cool one. So this is Linsky on screen now. Um, it's just classy. It's the brand from Chattanooga in Tennessee, specialised in titanium. In fact, the family, as far as I know, they started light speed bikes as well. Um, all they do is titanium, and they do it arguably more beautifully than anyone else. Uh, gorgeous stuff, really nice. Yeti, now this one's cool. So everyone knows the Yeti logo and there's a few different orientations of it, but the, the classic one that everyone really loves is the Yeti power sliding. Now you don't always see that one, uh, but it's super cool. Now, did you know how Yeti bikes got their name? I actually didn't and I had to look it up. Um, so apparently, so John Parker who started the brand he was really into his outdoor stuff and climbing and hiking or whatever. He had a sleeping bag by the company Yeti and he loved it so much and he loved the name of the company that later when the company actually folded, he asked if he could use the name for his bike company. I think that's cool and it really suits the mountain bike brand as well. Uh, yeah, kind of cool. Okay, so an industrial one for you, BTR. So this is a, uh, in fact, they're really local to us actually um, in the southwest of England. It's just industrial, it looks really cool. Straight out of factory, that's good. Um, Marin, you can't really not put that in, can you? One of the earliest mountain bike brands of all, based in Marin County. So, well, it's got pictures of mountains and they're Marin, Marin so that's kind of right by me. Now, I didn't think of this one, but someone said Atherton Bikes. Yeah, the A, it's dead simple. I think there's a bit of a ring here, isn't there? It? It's a bit of a theme of the simplistic ones seem to be the coolest ones. It's kind of classy, isn't it? Especially when there's barely any branding on the bikes. Yeah, it looks great. I know that's something that G especially liked on the bikes. And okay, the last one I'm going to throw in is Pivot. Now it's a Phoenix logo, which I think is cool anyway. And they've got a lot of bikes. They've got a Phoenix bike, they've got a Firebird, they've got various names along the same, same lines. But the reason I really like it, now I'm not a massive Star Wars superkick, although I do, I have watched all the films. Uh, let's just not talk about one, two, three, because they're terrible. But, um, the logo reminds me of the fit like the Alliance Starbird that you see on the X-Wing pilot's helmets. What do you reckon? Am I completely making it up? Well, it's basically a phoenix, isn't it? So um, it looks kind of similar and I think it's cool. And actually, I did dress up as an X-Wing pilot at a fancy dress party once. Yeah, I am sounding more like a Star Wars geek, aren't I? Um, but it was cool. I had, um, and I still got it somewhere, one of those Troy Lee open face helmets from when they first came out. Uh, I removed the peak off it, had the white helmet, and I had a Dragon Optics sticker on the helmet which is red kind of looking like that firebird as well because it was dragon something similar uh, i had a pair of orange dragon goggles on with the orange lens on them I had an orange boiler suit and i cut up an old uh, manky pair of well, danny's body armor jacket and stuck the armor on basically and it looked a, kind of a bit like in fact it's a really old picture right now it's not bad is it or is it terrible has anyone else ever done any fancy dress associated <laughs> associated with bike brands uh well, Anyway, have I missed any that you think are better than all of these? I'm going to go, I've got to say it, I'm going to go with Orange as the coolest one. Uh, not necessarily the coolest bike brand, you know, I don't have a preference of bike brands, but I just think their logo is so clean and it's just really cool. What's your favourite out of the ones I've just said? Uh, I'd love to know. Okay, so straight into news now, and first up is the new Ibis Ripley AF. 
Now, I rode the more recent version of the Ibis Ripley um, a few years back at Sea Otter, or just uh, pre Otter, technically. I just went out for a ride, borrowed one, and it just happened to be they were launched, they had a media launch that day. Um, I wasn't there for that, I was there to hang out with Scott Nickel. Went for a great ride of them, and I rode one of these bikes. Uh, in fact, it's a couple of shots of me on the bike. I think one of them's taken by Chips from Single Track Magazine, so thanks for that. And I think the others were from Ibis Bikes themselves. So, yeah, out for a great ride, rode the bike and it's really good. It's just my sort of bike, so it was 120, 29er, but they've done a slightly more modified version of this now, so a bit more up to date. So this is it on screen and some amazing pictures. So the rider in the pictures actually is Pat Smage. He's a 10 times US trials champion, and there's a really cool video with him riding. I'm gonna put a link to it in the description because we haven't got the rights to use it, unfortunately, uh, but check, check through to that and you'll see what he's all about. There's also an Ibis video with him riding on a mountain bike in that style. So keep an eye out for that, because this is gonna be mad. So the bike, comes, it's an alloy frame now, which is great. It comes in four sizes. Reach is from 425 to 500, so bang up to date. A 120 out bag, aim for a 130 fork on the front with 44 mil offset. So it's bang up to date in terms of that. 432 mil back end, so not too short. It's a good length on there. 29 inch wheels, of course. 65 and a half degree head angle. Makes me happy, that's a good sweet spot. Not too slack. I think you do lose a bit of responsiveness from bikes if you go too slack. That's a good amount, I reckon. Uh, 76 degree seat angle. Again, you could go steeper, but again, the front end would have to be proportionally bigger for that. So I think they've hit a nail on the head there, just like on my reactor. You know, it's not the steepest, and some people are like, eh, it doesn't climb as well, it hasn't got 78 degree. It doesn't need it on a bike like that. It works really well for it, it's fit for purpose. Uh, DW linkage, so they're really known for their, well, it's a Dave Weagle link, known for a lot of anti squat, so brilliant for climbing because the bike doesn't squat down, it just sits up and just goes like a rocket. The older version, or in fact, the alternative version made out of carbon that I rode, it certainly went like that, so this one's going to as well. Uh, it's got bearings on the upper link and it's got Igus bushings on those lower links. Now, the reason for that is the lower links, they don't move as much, and if bearings aren't enabled the full freedom to move, they get notchy and they uh, basically wear out quicker. So, having Igus bushings in the bottom is a smart choice and bearings on the top link, which moves quite a lot. So, uh, good selection there. There's boost, it's 2.6 inch wheel uh, tire clearance, long dropper post compatibility. Uh, the list goes on. But the cool thing is, they're available from just 3,000 US dollars now. Yeah, I know, that's a lot of money still, but this is an Ibis. So Ibis traditionally have been very high-end, I guess you could say boutique brands. I don't like saying that as much these days, given you know the variety that's out there. But this is bang up to date, an amazing bike from a great company with a great heritage. And you can have one now for $3,000. I think that's a really good price. Um, big news for them, I think. And that comes with Shimano Deal 12 speed, uh, good componentry on there as well. They haven't really cut any corners, there's good stuff on there. Uh, not a lot from what I can make out that you'd bother changing. I think it's really, really good. Okay, so news from Canada now from Da Vinci Cycles. They've got two new bikes. They've got the Marshall and they've got the Cobain. Right, so we're gonna start with the Cobain first. So this is 29 inch wheel hardtail. Uh, this is it, there's gonna be a load of images flying up on screen. They sent us some really cool press images here. So a progressive geometry hardtail, bang up today, 6061 T6 aluminium, threaded BB shell, hurrah. Uh, it's a boost 148 on the back, clearance for a 2.6 inch tire. Um, four sizes, reach goes from 420 to 500, again bang up to date, 435 mil chain stay on the back, 75 degree C angle, it's it's about as good as you possibly need, 319 mil bottom bracket height, so it's pretty slammed on there, lifetime warranty on the frame and build from 1299 US dollars, that's 1599 in Canadian and 1399 in Euros. Look, looks great, looks like a really good progressive hardtail. It looks like there's a lot of really good hardtails around at the moment. In fact, it's probably never been a better time to buy a good mountain bike trail hardtail because they're gonna be light and responsive, but also like burly enough to get a bit daft on if you wanna do that. You could dress one of those up a bit lighter with some lightweight wheels and tires, and you could cross, yeah, you could cross country ride it, no problem, or you could almost downhill it. I think that's a wicked sort of first bike or a second bike, or if you just like hardtails your bike. Uh, the other bike is called the Marshall. Now this comes in 29 and 27 and a half inch models, but they're size specific. So I think it's the extra small and the small come in 27 and a half, and the medium large and extra large come in 29, and the geometry size specific as well. So it's an aluminium frame, again made from T6 6061. It's a 130mm travel on the back, aimed for a 140mm fork, split pivot system. So it's a single pivot linkage activated, and instead of, instead of having the chainstay mounted pivot or a horse pivot, which is 
on the, sorry, uh, C-stay mounted pivot, which you'd see in a single pivot, or the horse, which is on the chain stay, it's actually directly on the axle. So it's an incredibly active rear end, but it's still, the chain stay remains the same length uh, under compression, so it's still single pivot. So it's a very cool back end on there. It's got four 30mm chain stays on the 27.5 inch, so the extra small and small, and 435 on the medium large and extra large. Four sizes from 420 to 500 mil reach on there. Uh, 66 and a half degree head angle, 76.8 degree seat angle, lifetime warranty, builds from 2099 in US dollars, 2599 in Canadian, and 2299 in Euros. Now I think it's kind of interesting here to see these two brands, you've got Da Vinci and Ibis, both launching alloy bikes, both at really good price points. I think that's pretty telling of what's going on in mountain biking at the moment. We have got loads of new people coming into the sport. And of course, people coming into sport, unless you've just got money falling out your pocket, you're not gonna spend a lot of money. Yeah, now don't get me wrong, you know, a couple of thousand dollars are still a lot of money for most people, but you're getting a lot of bike. And I think more people are giving you more bike than ever. Despite what's going on in the world, there's never been such a good time to get a bike. If you can get hold of one, of course, with the uh, bit of a shortage problem out there. So my suggestion is if you've got your eye on a bike and you see it in stock, just get it. Get it now. Okay, next up in news, a sea otter. It is happening. Just not happening at the beginning part of the year. It's being moved to fall or autumn if you're in the UK. So between the 7th and 10th of October, I don't have too many more details on it, but it looks like it's still going ahead at Laguna Seca Raceway in Monterey, California. At least I really hope it is because it's one of the nicest places to visit as far as work goes. And at that time of the year, it might be really good if traveling allows for us to go and visit a load of companies around Santa Cruz and stuff as well. Uh, there's loads of cool stuff. Of course, there's Santa Cruz bikes, there's uh, Giro Bell Sports, there's Ibis, there's, there's just dozens and dozens of brands located in the valley there, Scotts Valley. Um, well, we'll see what happens there. And maybe uh, Marin County as well, go back to the museum, go and visit Marin Cycles. Could do a really cool trip. So fingers crossed, towards the end of the year, um, things get a bit easier. I mean, I hope it gets easier for everyone anyway, but I also hope it gets better so we can go see more cool bikes. Okay, next up in news is actually return of a very cool product. So we did report last year at some point on the VHS slapper tape as a 2.0 model that comes out. Now, the VHS slapper tape was essentially based on one of my very favorite things, Scotch mastic tape. I'm always talking about this stuff. I swear I should have shares in this company. Brilliant stuff for making your own chain tape protectors, but it does involve getting creative. It's quite hard to get hold of and it's expensive. Nonetheless, it's great stuff. Anyhow, a cool company called Velocity Hucking Systems from New Zealand made their own version using, based on that, and it had a profile, basically has air bubbles along the chain state to absorb the impact. And now they've got their new version. So this one, I mean, packaging alone, is probably the coolest thing I've seen in a long time. It's a mini VHS cassette. How cool is that? I absolutely love it. Love what these guys are doing. And you open up on the inside, you get a big roll of stuff. So it's 350 mil long and I think it's 75 mil wide. Um, so the idea is you can make a full on chainstay protector, wraps around your chainstay, or you can trim it to suit. So uh, the fact is it's there and it looks very pro. It looks like one of those ones you're starting to get on some clued up manufacturers bikes now. Now again, it's got those air pockets on here that really do dampen down the sound. Uh, yeah, so 350 mil long, uh, 75 wide. Malleable 3M rubber, air pockets on there. It's 24.99 in the UK, 26.53 euros, 32 US dollars, or 44.99 in New Zealand. I absolutely love it. And I think the packaging is one of the coolest bits of packaging. Obviously it's recyclable, which is great, so no problem, but I think I'll keep that because I think it just looks ace. I think it's wicked. Kind of reminds me a little bit actually of um, the muck off rim tape, wherever that is. I've got some floating around. Yeah, knock off tubeless rim tape. So kind of a bit of a tape thing going on here. Kind of an 80s vibe. Love it, it's cool stuff. And again, that's a recyclable packaging, but too cool to actually get rid of. So uh, love it, really cool stuff. If you want to silence your bike and you don't fancy putting one of those chainstay sort of uh, guards on that you get from STFU, that's more like a chain guide. Uh, this is the way you want to do it. Super cool product, love it. Love what you guys are doing, awesome stuff. Thanks for sending this one. Okay, next up in news, actually I want to throw you to a podcast from Downtime Podcasts. Uh, it's an especially good one, they've done loads of good stuff, and in fact, I'm gonna put a link to Downtime in the description underneath, uh, on Spotify, um, 
iTunes, you know, Apple Podcasts, all that sort of stuff, so you can figure that out yourself. But this one's with Gary Fisher, so it's a bit of a special one from my point of view because it's a fascinating story. I urge you, if you've got a couple hours spare, listen to this podcast. It's really, really good. Well worth a listen. I think it's one of the best ones yet because it's very diverse. There's a lot of different things talked about in there. Uh, cycling in cities, the future of cycling, Gary Fisher on acid, like all sorts of cool stuff in there. So have a listen to that. And also, I just want to throw to this book again. I've still got nowhere near to reading it because currently I'm reading, I'm reading this one, The Book of Trespass, um, all about countryside rights in the UK, but um, nothing to do with bikes currently in there. But the Gareth Fisher book, I can't emphasize to you how cool this is to look through. Now, I'm not even sure it's available in the UK yet. I know you can get it via Trek Bikes and it will be available in the UK soon, but it, I literally, I can't wait to read this, but I don't want to look through it too much in advance. I'd like to finish a book, move aside, move on. But if you want to learn more about the legend, Gary Fisher and what he wants to talk about, check it out, definitely. Okay, now let's jump into comments from last week's show. Uh, this was kind of about the uh, the fast or fun type thing that I was talking about. Uh, you know, I said, you know, going fast is fun, but what I was talking about is more the racing thing. So first one from Neil Martin. I mainly ride to enjoy the outdoors, loads of single track around where I live. I got back into mountain bike to help my mental health issues, but as a side effect, I started using Strava to add a bit of a challenge. I don't care about KOMs, but I like trying to get PBs. Um, that's really cool what you say about the mental health issues, because I actually find I, I really need to get out to like sort my head out as well, and, and I'm not alone in this. I know there's a lot of people that kind of rely on it for good headspace to like clear your head. You know, it's, um, I've, I've said for a long time that mountain biking is, you know, it cheers me up when I'm sad, it calms me down when I'm angry. It's like, that's that's my vessel for good headspace. Uh, so it's really nice to hear it is for you as well. Uh, Fire Trail MTB. For me, it's about the adventure going somewhere, taking in new scenery. Um, and if it's if it's got good downhill, then happy days. Mountain biking is so beneficial to mental health and that's why I do what I do. Strava, I only really use to bet myself. I never compete with anyone else, just myself, um, riding into an adventure. Yep, great stuff. And again, beneficial for mental health. You know, especially in the last year or so from working from home, I think everyone's really been, you know, having to focus on anything they can to look after your well-being. So anyone out there, if you are struggling, don't sit in silence, do something about it. You know, it can feel quite hard if you're trapped away, but um, you're not alone, that's for sure. Uh, Robert Wine, couldn't care less about racing and races. What's important to me is the M in MTB. Yeah, right on Robert, I'm with you there for sure. Tim Miller, thank you Doddy. Yep, Strava is great, but I find myself distracted from the beauty of the ride and the great outdoors, um, <laughs> if it's for digital numbers and miles. Yeah, I, I, I agree, like I said on both things, I really appreciate the technology. You know, I use a Garmin watch or I use a Garmin on my bike to record what I'm doing, but it's for, it's. You know, I'm not doing it for training or any purposes like that. I'm doing it to just identify what I'm doing. And I pay little attention to that stuff when I'm actually riding. I'm eyes up. You know, I want to see what's going on and look around me because there's so much beautiful stuff out there. Uh, Joe D. I'm a racer at heart. I love downhill more than anything. But being on the edge all the time cooks the brain. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, sometimes it's better to get out with the crew and sessions and jumps or fun trails. Yeah, I guess, you know, like... Any, any form of racing, it's intense, isn't it? Because you're so focused. I, I guess that's why it's so good, because you're just channeled completely into one thing. So I guess it kind of, you know, it's therapeutic in a different way. Uh, Richard Polidor. Mountain biking is carrying camping gear to the woods to recharge the inner child in me. Hey, do you know what? I still haven't been bikepacking. I'm, I really want to go bikepacking this year. In fact, I think that's, that's going to be one of the things I must do this year. Yeah, I'm going to sign myself up to doing something. I'm going to find a couple of friends who want to do that. I love that idea. Uh, Stuart Ketchley, I'm someone that thrives on riding with friends, whatever the activity. Fun or fast, as long as you can laugh. But yeah, fundamentally, that is the thing that, and having a laugh is the biggest part of mountain biking. I mean, look at cycling as a sport. It's pretty daft, isn't it, really? We're, we're wobbling down the street on things you balance on. You know, to an outsider, it's not the coolest thing, is it? But um, I think it's cool. Big smelly rangy. Combination of both. Torturing myself on a muddy climb that leaves me blowing out my ass is fun. Uh, it makes me feel good. It's all about getting out there. I'm not good enough to go fast anywhere. Anyway, oh, and my missus bought me the Lego Audi Quattro for Christmas, like the one I have on the shelf. Yeah, I asked for one for Christmas, but I ended up having to buy it myself because um, Father Christmas didn't deliver. But, um, you know, it's interesting what a lot of you are saying in here, you know, about the, the mental health, especially about the thriving and riding with friends. You know, I think that's something that for a lot of us has been kind of denied the last year because of social distancing and where you're lo geographically located. You know, and I've, I've 
got to say, I've not ridden much in months. You know, it's you know, a bit challenging working from home mostly, not speaking to people for days on end other than for your computer screen. It's the same for everyone. You know, we're all we've all got these things. I've got to say. I've, I've found it hard to have the time to get out on the bike with my son Dustin being five months old now. So, you know, that's, that's kept us both busy here and I need to be supportive to my wife and all this. But also, it's it's been bad for me to not get out. You know, I'd be worried about my own health, my own sanity. So I actually went out at the weekend and it was one of the hardest rides I've done for a while. And I actually recorded my highest heart rate of all time, which I don't know out 41 if I should be really proud of or terrified by. So I think my highest, averages is about 180 um which for 41 is yeah i should be about 170 really 175 something like that um i got over 190 which tell me am I, is my heart going to pop or what's going to go on is it stress related i didn't feel any worse than usual although the conditions were utter quagmire so I was working super hard even on flat stuff just to keep on going you know what it's like if you're riding conditions like that but um yeah i was it was kind of a bit terrifying so it's definitely motivated me to have a look at that um, maybe drink a little less coffee try and feel a little less stressed about things and uh, look after myself a bit more uh, but the same to everyone out there look after yourselves uh, look after your head get out on your bikes it's good for you all right quiz time we all have a quiz don't we okay so questions are coming up on screen i'm going to give you three questions you're going to give me three answers uh, we'll pick those up a bit later in the show so the first one Okay, so this is an interesting one to test the uber geeks out there. So what was the first full carbon, uh, we're talking like a monocoque here, not like a carbon tubed bike. Uh, what was the first full carbon monocoque style mountain bike? Um, and a bonus, I guess, for the, for the for the year of it. I'll give you a little clue here if it helps you on your way, or it might, it might mask it. This Ibis is carbon tubed, uh, but it's a metal lugged frame. So I think it's got alloy lugs on this particular frame. Uh, that dates to 1988. In fact, I'm lying, I think it's a steel, steel lugged, but whatever, I think it's from 1988. So if that helps you think around timing at all. Okay, next question coming up on screen right now. What is the axle width of Superboost and name a company that uses it? There's a few out there. Okay, last question. Dropper posts come in three major varieties. Now, just take a second to think about it. They obviously all go up and down, okay? But you get a fully hydraulic design, you get semi-hydraulic designs, and you get cartridge-based designs. Give me an example of each one. We'll pick up questions a bit later on, okay? Okay, now it's into Bike Cave. Now, I mentioned last week that we hadn't had a lot of entries for stuff. Turns out the uploader was broken. Um, so I've had a word with someone and it's fixed now. So you can continue to send your entries in. Uh, the uploader link for all three of our uh, uploader content is in the description underneath. Uh, there it is right there on screen as well. Now the first one, I'm pleased to say, is a video. So up on the screen right now playing is a video from Gary. Yes, at last, some video entries. This is great. It's like the pictures, I've got to say, the pictures look better quality, but it's really nice to actually get uh, the sort of perspective from your camera. Now, the first thing I noticed on here, other than the GMBN sticker on your tool chest and the EBC brake pads sticker on there as well, is the fact you've got what looks like a tractor seat stool. Is it a tractor seat or is it just looks like that way? Either way, it's very cool. I'm really into that. Uh, some great stuff you've got tucked away in here. Gary, this is like a really crammed shed. I mean, this is a definition of a proper, like, uh, you know, what I think what a lot of people see is the typical men and sheds type shed. It's got everything in there to make just about everything. I love it. So it's a DIY bike cave in a shed, shed with my DIY tools. I made all the workbenches and tool stands mobile and built the cabinets to be wall mounted so to be uh, as to maximize the floor space. After watching the Blake Builds series, I'm tempted to rework the layout in the summer, perhaps. Yeah, do you know, having a rework is always a good idea. I mean, to be fair, you'll see it's really neat and tidy, the way you've got the bikes racked up on the side. I want to have a rework in here as well, because of the fact that this was always my place and in the last year, it's basically turned into my, my working place. So I think I want to just disassociate a bit and just change things around. So I'll see what I can do with it. But I do also want to build another one. Um, I've got some space coming up outside and I'm going to build something else. So uh, we shall see about that. But this is awesome, mate. Really, really cool. And I love the fact you've built all this stuff. Your, like your pegboard and stuff, 
hidden away inside that unit. I do like that look. I do feel like I could sort of get some units on the wall. I mean, I've got my nice big units underneath, so I don't know if I need that space. I kind of like having a gallery wall on the back, but hey, maybe I should change as well. But uh, I love what you've done. It looks really cool. Super neat and tidy as well, I've got to say. You've got a wheel, you've got a spoke tension meter up there, you've got your vinyl gloves, you've got Shimano brakes on your bikes, and you've got a Rockstrust reverb seat post, by the looks of it as well, judging by the oils you've got in there. WD-40, Markov stuff, Stanley adjustable spanner, loads of good stuff in there. Awesome stuff. Thank you very much for that, Gary. Okay, next up is from Glen in Wellington, New Zealand. Awesome stuff. Okay, so um, I didn't want to leave uh, Pride and Joy in the shed, so they live inside of me. I'm lucky enough to have my own room inside the house, which has been my man cave, the housing, all my tools. I tell you what, that's the dream, isn't it, to have a place inside the house. Well, technically this is inside my house, so it's kind of okay, but, um, um, but I know I'm in, inside the house, turning a regular room into a man cave, brilliant. Decided my bikes need to squeeze in here too. At a time I only had one bike, so I hung it from the wall, but now I've got my hardtail, so space is at a premium. I've got a tool chest, I'm slowly building up the tool collection. Just enough space to set up the repair stand and the tool chest works as a bench top. Yeah, they're good though, isn't they? A nice rubber mat on them. Don't know what brand it is, it looks good though. Obviously into your cars as well. And your Marvel. And your, what's that, Lego Techniques, something or other on the back. Looking good. Awesome stuff, that is a proper den, isn't it? So, you must be into films and gaming and all sorts of stuff. RC cars, look at those monster cars on the back. I love it, it looks awesome. It's well good. You're into collectibles as well. And it looks like you're into drinking yards of ale as well. That's something I've never been able to do. I mean, I'm quick at drinking a beer, but and um, I'm quick at drinking repeated beers as well. I mean, my friends will tell you that, but um, yard of ale is just something that just does not work with my body. Maybe I need to work on that. Hmm. All right, now it's time for some quiz answers. Now, how did you get on? All right, so first question was, what was the first full carbon fiber mountain bike? And just to emphasize the point again, I wasn't looking for carbon tubed and lugged, I was looking for a full monocoque one. Anyone get it? No? Kestrel. It was the MXZ. So here's a couple on screen. In fact, I saw it in a bike shop or a cafe in Santa Cruz in about 2005 or something like that, um, a long time back. And hopefully there's also a shot, if I could find it, on screen now of, of what it looked like in the catalogue back in the day. Now, guess when this came out? In 1988. 1988! Can you imagine this thing in 1988 with the state of other mountain bikes? This was a look at the future. Uh, incredible work. And in fact, some of the people behind Kestrel Cycles that were working on this particular bike are actually working with Ibis Cycles, developing the way they manufacture carbon fibre at the moment. The next one was, uh, what is the axle width of Superboost and name a company that's using it? Anyone? So regular was, well, originally it was 135, then it went up to 142, then boost was 148, yes, 157, 157 millimeters. Um, pivot cycles are using it. So on Nolly, there's various other brands. Uh, give yourself a pat on the back if you've got that one right. And the next one is dropper posts come in three major varieties, fully hydraulic, semi-hydraulic, and cartridge-based designs. I want an example of each. Yep, so the fully hydraulic one, bit of a clue in that, it's the Rockstrust Reverb, it's the only one that's got a hydraulic hose system with a remote control on it to operate the hydraulic post. Most other posts are hydraulic on the market, but ones I was looking for that had a cable operation but a hydraulic post, you can tell if it's a hydraulic post or not because of the fact, in fact I forgot one here, it has an air valve at the top. That means it's got an internal floating piston on the inside, you charge up the air as the spring effectively, and it's got oil on the other side, and it's basically you push the oil into a different chamber for the post to drop, and then you close the port, and it locks in place, opens the port, air extends the post again. A really cool system. Uh, any other brands I was looking for, Fox, the transfer post, uh, KS, various models, got the LEV, they got all the LEV post, the bike yoke, uh, it was specialized posts like this one here I've randomly got I don't know why and yeah there's a few other ones and then of course there's the cartridge based design which have one of these on the inside so again that's still that's still a hydraulic unit but it's on the inside of here um, 
and it's a non-adjustable unit, so if that ever fails, you replace that on its own, which is great. And it reminds me a little bit of the struts you get on the uh, inside of your boot hatch in your car. But really cool system. Loads of companies using those. They're probably the most popular uh, as far as wide range go because of the fact they're so easy to manufacture so consistently well. Uh, Giant use them on their own brand post. Um, who else have I got? Pro, which is the Shimano one, Brand X, SDG, Crank Brothers, the list goes on, there's loads of them. Uh, hopefully you got those right and hopefully you learned something as well. Um, and that really is the end of this week's show. So hopefully you enjoyed the show, hopefully you uh, learned something from me perhaps, and uh, let us know what you think in those comments. And we'll see you next week. ta -ra.